Good evening, everyone. Can you hear me okay? Is that all right? Is the volume good? All right. If we have any issues with the audio, please just raise your hand and we'll fix it. Um, thank you so much for being here tonight. I'm Gabrielle Griffiths. I am the Outreach Coordinator here at Wellfleet Public Library. Um, before we begin, I would just ask that if you have a smartphone um, or a cellular device, if you could please put it on silent or just turn it off. Um, our exits are here and here, and I think those are just the, the general logistics. Um, I'm really, really excited to be introducing our readers tonight. Um, I am a good friend of John Bananis, or I would say that I consider John to be a good friend because he's such a great person um, and such a valuable member of, of the community here. And it's always just um, such a joy to see everything that he's doing and um, always a pleasure to run into him when I'm out and about. So um, very, very happy. Um, and I'm also really um, glad to be introducing um, both Stephen and, and Howie tonight. There you are. I was like, where, where is you? Where are you? Um, so, so in any case, it's it's a huge privilege. So I'm really, really grateful. Um, I'm just going to introduce um, our three readers um, all at once, and then each reader will um, go for about 15 minutes each, um, and then we'll then we'll close. All right. John Banani serves as founding editor for the Cape Cod Poetry Review. He is the recipient of scholarships from the Gale Fund and the Fine Arts Work Center in Provincetown, as well as a residency from AS220 in Providence, Rhode Island. His poems have appeared in Cut Bank, Hayden's Ferry Review, Hobart, Seattle Review, Washington Square Review, Verse Daily, and Prairie Schooner, and his book reviews have appeared in Rain Taxi, Tupelo Quarterly, and Kenyon Review. Our next speaker, our next poet, Stephen Delbos, is a writer from Plymouth who lives in Prague. His poetry, essays, and translations have appeared internationally. He is the editor from A Terrace in Prague, a Prague poetry anthology. His play, Chetty's Lullaby, about the life of trumpet legend Chet Baker, was produced in San Francisco in 2014. His co-translation of The Absolute Gravedigger by, by the Czech surrealist poet was awarded the Penn Heim Translation Grant in 2015 and was published by Twisted Spoon Press. Death Empire, his play about the Czech composer Smetna, was produced by the Prague Shakespeare Company in 2017. He is the author of the poetry chapbook In Memory of Fire and the poetry collection Light Reading. He is a founder, founding editor of Body, um, and you can you know, see that literary magazine at body, bodyliterature.com. And our last poet, Howie Good, is a journalism professor at SUNY New Paltz. He is the author of The Loser's Guide to Street Fighting, winner of the 2017 Laureate Prize from Thought Crime Press, and Dangerous Acts Starring Unstable Elements, winner of the 2015 Press Americana Prize for Poetry. His latest poetry collections are I Am Not a Robot from Tolson Books, A Room at the Heartbreak Hotel from Analog Submission Press, and The Titanic, sa the Titanic Sales at Dawn from Alien Buddha Press. A collection of prose poems, what is it and how to use it will be published this month by Great Book Press. He co-edits the online journals Unbroken and Unlost. So I'm really excited and without further ado, please join me in welcoming um, all of our poets, but our first poet, um, John Banani. <laughs> Um, thank you so much, Gabby. Um, thank you for organizing this. Thank you for putting together the flyers. Thank you for um, all that you do here at, at the Wellfleet Library. Um, if you ask anyone in town or anywhere really um, on the Cape where one of the best places to read is, it's Wellfleet Library. And uh, I've, I've told them that before because it's just, it's such a warm community here and um, I'm always thankful to be here. Um, I'm going to start um, with some poems that uh, focus a lot on uh, the Stonewall riots. I don't, I don't know if you guys are familiar with them. If you're not, um, Stone, the Stonewall Inn was a um, gay bar in New York City in 1969. Um, and it's, it wasn't a gay bar in the sense that we know gay bars today. It wasn't gay owned. It was owned by the mafia. So what gay bars looked like back then were... Um, the mafia owned them, and they exploited the gay dollar. 
And then the mafia paid off uh, police officers in order that the police officers would not raid the bar because in 1969 it was still illegal to be gay. So um, a lot of these poems surround that. Um, I used uh, quite a few sources uh, in order to write them. The, the primary source for this is uh, Stonewall, The Riots That Sparked the Gay Revolution by David Carter. I also, um, there's also another book called Stonewall. Um, and then there's also um, actually a Stonewall veteran that lives in Yarmouth, uh, believe it or not. So I, I talked to him and his name's David Vasquez. In Trap, New York City, 1962. Inside my chest, a bowling ball, chest upright, back sags, spinal rift against torso, to walk an endless chore, lift up. The bar, the bathhouse, to uncarry this weight, the heft, the engine of my ribs, the marrow holding it up, but here was a place to roll, to unleverage, to rock up and then down, to feel the ball lifted, born with a ball. It could be gone for a moment with the right drink, but even that got inverted into raids. The badges, the let me buy you a drink, you're arrested devil with the blue dress on, so it became the bathhouse where the chest could tighten and then unstrangle the weight with a grunt, a moan, a sweat stream down the legs. He was exposed, legs out in a V, his hand against his groin, massaging his thigh open, your thighness. I approached, I bowed, he was masturbating, then his badge. The water. No, it was not the bar, not the owners, not the drinks. The drinks were watered down. It was not the disease that came from the bar, that was hepatitis. Not the dancing, because the dancing was why we were there. But for me, it was the tub of water in its murk, where each drip, a ripple, the bartender would dip the, gl dip the glass and then reserve it, just like that. Return, dip, pour, serve, so that by the end of the night, all that bacteria was teeming. Raid, Greenwich Village, 1969. It was Stevie Wonder and me and my girls, dirt drinks in hand, sloshing in the current when the walls shook. Toss back the watered down drink when I showed my draft card, the name not matched to my lips, my dress, the walls, the doors still shaking. They lined us up by the bathrooms to check us, separate the queens from the gays, from the put me in a back room while they seized each bottle to the back, the back room, the back bar, all the queens checked for, lifted up, the back room, don't touch me, why do I see it so red now? We're taking the place, the bar, the baton moving, up my dress. That was Kiki's lipstick, that was my mom's dress. Bull. The bull dyke, she starts it, took four of them to drag her out, cuffed, kicked, wail, blood ribbon around her forehead, drag past cobblestones. She looks dead till strike muscle flail again. She throws leather knees, aim for their ball sacks. It was her head slam out of the paddy wagon, four cops back on her, knee thrust resist, back out, knee flail, kick back in. Why don't you stone butch in for three pieces of clothing, not conforming to gender? Don't be so rough, she tells them. We watch, strike back, kick in the wagon, then kick back out, then thrown in, then screams to us. Why don't you guys do something? Currency. Our hands as though we knew it was this first fist. The coins before must not have been enough. 
must not have kept them from coming. The stone, the carton, the coins, first the penny, then the nickel. It was the coins thrown first. Um, so this one, um, this protest, I, I believe, inherently is an act of symbolism. So I think it, reading a lot about these riots, uh, what I started to realize was that everything that was happening had this extra layer to it. Um, and, you know, it, it really reminds me of like when people start complaining about when um, people get together and block roads and they're like, well, they couldn't get to work. And you're like, well, yeah, no shit, that's the point, right? Yeah, you have to disrupt things in order for them to mean something. Um, so this, this poem revolves around, well, the last poem revolved around throwing coins. And uh, this poem revolves around a, a flaming garbage can that was thrown into the coat room at, at the Stonewall Inn. The closet. It was a can, a wired can, a garbage can. Someone, the lighter fluid, was it lighter fluid? Gasoline, it was the garbage, can lit, set flaming for moments, couldn't feel my skin. Then there it was, the whole furnace, lifted, raised, arc through, projected, thrown through, the window straight through and into the coat room, a, a trash, a garbage, a can, a flame. Uh, the police uh, were decided to barricade themselves inside of the inn after a lot of the protesters resisted, um, and they didn't really have the means to kind of uh, fight back, so they tried a hose. The hose. The next thing was the fire hose kept the flames dead, but water and gas keep a flame living alive, it's chemistry, water and lighter fluid. So they thought, better use a weapon, thought they could hose us down, put us out, and they pour it, this hose, pour it through a hole in the wood, through their barricade, so that when it sprayed, our bellies birthed laughter. Jerk it, someone yelled, that fire hose limp protruding through their wood. Um, a lot of the uh, resistors also started a line dance. A line dance. To them, I say, sing. To them, we are the girls. To the nights we passed and to the nights we didn't. We come forth. We retreat by clubs. We come back again and we sing. We are the Stonewall girls. We wear our hair in curls. And if they ask, so what? And so what of the blood? Is that something that should scare me, scare queen? This is the shit I see all night. And so a little more, this time with feeling. We are the Stonewall girls. We wear our hair in curls. Should the blood even phase me? It's blood. Whose streets? Blood. Our streets. We don't wear underwear. We show our pubic hairs. I'm a rockette. See these legs? That's no accident. Law. Taken for something you are. Are you? You are. Taken, except when to not place the flame from your chest into someone is to watch it die in fingertips drawn from the contour lines, traced from history's cold hand. Before it, keep going. Look, keep tracing. The page burns, flammable from the start. It was always there. Um, so that's part of a manuscript that kind of oscillates between histories of LGBTQ uh, cultures as well as my own personal uh, journey through that. Um, and after I had finished that manuscript, I, I looked back on it and I, uh, 
I realized that I didn't have anything in there related to the HIV AIDS epidemic. And I, I saw a lot of problems with that as, as a gay person. And I wanted to kind of look at that and kind of understand why. So I started another manuscript. Um, and this one is called, uh, I, I don't have a title for it yet, um, but I have, an, I have an introduction for it. And it's a Carl Jung quote. Forgetting, for instance, is a normal process in which certain conscious ideas lose their specific energy because one's attention has been deflected. When interest turns elsewhere, it leaves, the sh it leaves the sh in the shadow the things with which one was previously concerned, just as a searchlight lights upon a new area by leaving another in the darkness. But the forgotten ideas have not ceased to exist. Although they cannot be re reproduced at will, they are present in a subliminal state, just beyond the threshold of recall, from which they can rise again, spontaneously, at any time, often after many years of apparently total oblivion. Um, and Sarah Schulman wrote a, wrote a book called The Gentrification of the Mind, uh, in which she argues that a lot of the consciousness surrounding HIV AIDS was lost. And it was lost because so many amazing artists had died from the epidemic. So there was a lack of consciousness um, surrounding it. And, and the memory around it um, is, is often lacking. And, and that also co-occurred with Reaganomics. So you have these kind of multiple um, things kind of uh, causing people's consciousness and consciousness surrounding HIV AIDS to, to lose their, their footing. Memorial One, Provincetown, June 16th, 2017. And I want you to know that I parked myself here in the center of a torn down pier on this side of Cape Cod, a fist where I heard you in the steady breeze rolling off the bay to know that this is your memorial. Columns holding up what once people walked on, docked their ships on, prepared for labor and death on, algae wood cylinders, sun bleached trunks, dead wood hammered deep into this sand soft ground, to know the sundial still casts dimension on each standing figure, to know the tide still touches you and you it. Over 50. Reuben said, I was lucky that what I preferred kept me from getting it. David said, I kept to myself. I went home alone most nights. Alice said, it confirmed for me how scared everyone was. Bob said, it's almost trendy to get it now. It makes you a part of something. Jim said, I wasn't out then. It took me longer to come out. Michael said, there must be thousands of other stories just like that one. Ashes spread in those dunes. Jay said, people just started talking about this strange thing that happened. This guy was in the hospital and before we knew it, he had died. Lo and behold, a year later, Mark said, she is a phantom hand who forms the letters of your name and the word that begins with, with a P. Peter said, it was the 80s. Everyone was terrified of being gay. Alan said, if you were a gay man, you didn't know if you were going to get sick or not. JP invited us over for dinner and said, we moved here to get away. I brought red wine and he didn't drink. Um, I'm going to read one more. Um, this is... Gaten Dugas uh, was referred to as patient zero in a, in a seminal AIDS text called And the Band Played On. Um, a lot of people came to think that patient zero meant that uh, he was the first person to get it and the first person to spread it. Um, 
obviously that was not the case. You know, it, AIDS didn't come from one person spreading it around. So uh, it's just sad that that had to kind of market the book and, and market the book in such a way that that wasn't necessary. Elegy for Gaten Dugas, who picked up men wherever he went, who donated his blood, who I am the prettiest one, who donated the appalling saga of patient zero, whose zero meant O, as in letter O, as in out of California. And though AIDS came to the United States in 1959, and before that, Central Africa, about 1930, who did not slaughter a chimpanzee for meat, but who, the monster who gave us AIDS, donated his blood to slides, to lab tests, to electron microscopes, who, the Columbus of AIDS, let the tip of the needle draw his blood for more, a vaccine, escape, an answer, but who was a strange guy at the 8th and Howard bathhouse, a blonde with a French accent, who said, gay cancer, maybe you'll get it too. Although who at that time could not have possibly known that what he had was transmitted through sex, though a publicist who, for a book on the subject, stated, it's the worst kind of yellow journalism, and said, don't blame Randy, blame me, who admitted to making it up for a complete, for a compete, to compete for sales, even though patient zero, the man who brought AIDS to California, whose zero now coming to mean the first who spread it, despite being the first, who did extend one bone white arm, who made a fist, and who could at first see the vein. Thank you. That was very powerful, John. Thanks for that miracle history. Yeah, it's wonderful. I'm very happy to be here. Thank you for the wonderful introduction. Thank you all for coming. Uh, my name is Stephen. And uh, one poet that I really uh, admire, this uh, German language poet Rilke, said that uh, every great poem begins in elegy and ends in praise. Uh, and so John's poems kind of started us there, and, and these first poems that I'll read will continue that, uh, and then hopefully we'll come to some praise along the way. Not that there wasn't beautiful praise in your poems as well. So this poem's called In Memory of Fire. Until our flesh gives birth to bones, when the bridges of our fingers fall to earth, until our eyes ignite in memory of fire, flash bulbed as the dead sockets of blind men when this prophecy is elegy, we won't remember that May evening in a park when the flickering lanterns of lightning paraphrase our faces, but until the beds in which we slept are cinders and those cinders ash and ash a vacant story for the wind until that city where I reigned the wild carriage of your tears becomes a tenement of ice, the borrowed letters of our names, a scattered flock of startled crows, the days we shared are indestructible. Uh, I'd like to continue with a series of poems that are about uh, the, the area. So uh, I grew up in Plymouth. Uh, my parents who are here tonight still live in Plymouth and I always love to visit as I do uh, as often as I, as I can. Uh, not often enough as you can tell from the crack in my voice. But um, you know, Plymouth for me, uh, it, it's some, somehow somewhat uh, elegiac, at least summer is, you know, it's always tied up in the feeling that uh, summer is always ending too soon, and always August is always coming too soon. Uh, and so, as I was putting some poems together to read tonight, um, I, I, I was putting together these these beach poems and these Plymouth poems and these Cape Cod poems, and I was actually surprised by how many of them uh, that I had, kind of uncollected, uh, just lying around and so forth. And as I began to read through them, I started to notice that they all have this kind of something sad. You know, there's a few beach balls and, uh, 
you know, koozies and so forth, but something is kind of elegiac about all of them. So uh, I'd like to read a few of these poems. And the first poem that I read in memory of fire is the title poem of a chat book that uh, was published, you know, by John Bonani and his wonderful Cape Cod Poetry Review a few years ago. Um, and this uh, first poem I'll read uh, from a series of poems was also published in, uh, I think, the last issue of the magazine, co-edited with uh, John Landry, really wonderful stuff. Uh, and so this is uh, the first poem from a suite of, poem called, of poems called Long Beach Suite, uh, Long Beach kind of series of poems, and Long Beach is the beach in Plymouth. And this first poem is called Still Life with Wampanoags. Squint your eyes on certain stretches of beach where dunes nest the chatter of winged generations and see this place as first tribes saw. No purpose but longing. I think of Earth's entropy and we, riven from early principles, even stepping softly footprints sink, deadened in the sun, a far sail slices horizon. My mind erases pickup trucks, sea shacks, rusted jumper cables tumbling in hoarding tide. Lighthouses slide underwater of imagination. Another world I want to know. But I wake, rise, and drive off Long Beach stopping for lobster. What monk or sad soldier escapes forever desperate senses? A native of nothing, I camp sometimes in the wild shadow of what vanished. This is called Visiting Plymouth. Waiting on the past, dark beach, buoyed light, channel markers glare, final cries of gulls drown, dunes sunk in the slumber. Nothing out here to speak of. Why do we insist we stay? I pocket a hand full of night-washed sand. Summer's symbol, I declare. No one wants this season over. August always ceases. We go on. Uh, and this is... Uh, those, this is a, a newer poem, but also uh, it's called Charlie Parker on Cape Cod, 1954. Um, and yeah, so Charlie Parker, great, you know, jazz saxophonist from, you know, St. Louis known as the Bird uh, or just Bird. Uh, he was on Cape Cod in 1954, was kind of sent down here to, to clean up his act. Um, the only other thing you need, might need to know and I won't presume that anyone already knows, but a shiv is uh, like a prison kind of knife. I had to look it up myself, of course. Uh, yes, Charlie Parker on Cape Cod, 1954. Here at the end of America and me, wings clipped, sand flecked, feather lips, low tide, long life. Wish I was sitting pretty in light city, not caught like a cod on the cape, the soft segmented bellies of crabs these bastard seagulls peck apart on the February beach. Give me the melodic breath of brass and I will show you who I can be, but they tell me I am off track, my arms scabbed with the guilty maneuvers of midnight setbacks, daytime insanity, help me, no God, damn these grounded clouds, tied a trapped slave in the false tumult of waves, no sea in St. Louis who needs it. Salt grass, razor clams, the bitter bare landscape, and sand falling from my soul's holes get me out and outer. I have lost the fight and flight is nothing but a sick dream. Come too far, nothing back there. Nowhere is my destination. F the pilgrims, landed here and laid waste to the original race. My brothers, natives in a land, in a country with another name. This place, my unbidden purgatory. Help me, honeybee, 
starfish on the salt marquee, these sand dunes a new Jerusalem, this hull, my husk, my body, all of this is silent now. Song is a shiv that slices air, and I stick the core of wind to make melody from what's left over and leave nothing behind. Dying is a deed I have no time for, every breath a death I won't do twice. August matinee. Lightning punctuates dark bay distance. Too late summer, bodies ache for rain, breeze, relief in canvas air. Thunder, a tree explodes, crows intimating meaning. September rains. Uh, this is called Aeolian, Massachusetts, and uh, an Aeolian harp was a kind of instrument that was popular in the Romantic Age in Britain, uh, and you would hang it kind of like wind chimes, but a harp that you would hang in, your, in an open window and the wind uh, would play. And Coleridge, the great uh, British Romantic poet, has a, uh, has a great poem about an Aeolian harp, and this is Aeolian, uh, Massachusetts. Aeolian, Massachusetts, which if you haven't been there yet, you can ask me for directions later. <laughs> Aeolian, Massachusetts. In the title, it's just M-A with a period, which is a little more elegant, but it's not Aeolian, Ma. It's, you know, Aeolian, Massachusetts. Okay. However can the wind tatter American flags and unzip stripes to white crotches of stars. Break, th break stiff-spined oaks edging this old landfill, yet leave shadows of humans unmoved. Any hometown is a complexion of occasions, handless ghosts, bee-stinger teeth of time. Wind withdraws, skies held breath, memory effaced as the supplicant grasses However can the wind, inanimate mover, finger old keys of dirge nostalgia. Um, to shift gears a little bit, I've, I really like Edmund Wilson. This is uh, his journals from the 1940s. He lived in Wellfleet uh, and died in Wellfleet. And I was, I've been a fan reading his journals. Uh, this is the 40s. They go from the 20s to the 60s and uh, kind of been reading them over the last few years in the summer. Nice summer reading. Uh, and anyways, he uh, was reading this one actually today, and he has this entry from the Spectacle Ponds, early July uh, 1948, that I'd just like to read as a kind of invocation to Wellfleet. Um, very quickly, Spectacle Ponds is just a journal entry, uh, spectacle, which is right down the road. I tried to get there today driving in a big pickup truck that should have made it, but I still got scared and turned back. Uh, I was with my, my son. He was having a great time. Wasn't worried about flipping over. But uh, okay, Spectacle Ponds, early July 1948. I went there for the first time with Raul, his son, then with Elena, his wife, not long afterward. I had expected to find them interesting from what I had heard, and they enchanted me when I found them after several futile ex exhibitions and had on me an emotional effect. The emotional effect of this spot was due, I suppose, to some affinity that I felt between it and my life at this time, and a darkness into which I sink in a clear, round, single lens, well guarded and hidden away, Many things nourished and lurking at the bottom that have not yet been brought to light. Elena, when she swam across it, said it was a little stagnant. Uh, I'd very like, so I, yes, I would like to read uh, a, a couple of translations from this Czech poet, Vítislav Nezval, who's just wonderful and fantastic. Uh, and then to end, I'll read a couple poems from my new collection. Uh, and I have, you know, copies for wampum if anyone is, uh, you know, I'll be in the, in those stacks later. 
I'd just like to read, I think maybe one poem from this book that just kind of captures, Nezval is this Czech poet. This book originally came out in 1937. Surrealism, he's using imagery in very interesting ways, uh, but he was uh, also a very, he was an urban poet, but he came from the kind of a more rural, the countryside in a way. And so he can capture the urban spirit, but he also captures the countryside in an interesting way. And in this poem uh, that I will read called In the Courtyard, there's something a little bit of the Cape Cod, you know, summer afternoon, maybe not, not so much Cape Cod anymore, too much traffic, but, you know, something of the summer afternoon, you're just, time is slowing down and you're just, you know, everything seems to stop except for the flies or something like that. Yeah. Uh, in the Courtyard. In the courtyard, an old coach crumbled from ages past serves as sanctuary for a black pup who catches the scent of a nearby funeral. The corpse in the coffin kicks up its feet and the dog bares its teeth at a polecat. Out back wide rivers flow and a windmill in a windless late afternoon casts its shadow, no sound. The hens tend to their petty needs. Wild geese descend on the villages. The scent of peppermint candy betrays cracked cabinets. Grass waits to be trampled. Another mill starts far in the valley. Ghostly flour pours into sacks and dung glistens in the fields. Wind enchanted in the mill, someone sings. Owls with craven heads sleep in the ancient tower. On the steps, a tin liter mug of unfinished beer. The people suddenly gone. The clock chimes the half hour. Everything will be stolen. It is Monday, like somewhere in Italy, and the courtyard swallows roost on a set table. This is a new collection uh, of poems. It's called Light Reading, and it's from Blaise Vox. They're based in Buffalo, and did, they did, uh, Jeffrey Gatza, the editor, just did such a beautiful job. This is a photo of uh, St. Vitus Cathedral in Prague from uh, a wonderful... Uh, Czech photographer from 1928, Josef Sudek is his name. Um, and so there are, some of these poems are very, very short, and I'm going to read uh, one or two from a section called Bagatelles for Typewriter. Um, and uh, a bagatelle is usually a phrase that's associated with classical music. It's a French word that means a trifle, you know, something that's sort of light and tossed off which originally indeed it, it would have been, but then of, of course, you know, uh, composers start to use it in a kind of ironic way to write a very complex piece of music and title it a bagatelle, you know, as if you're some kind of freak of genius or something. Uh, so this poem, all of these are, are titled bagatelle for something. Um, and this poem is called bagatelle for tofu, Szechuan tofu, sing tao, li bo, and plate spinner which I assume doesn't need any explanation. But uh, it's about Chinese poets. So there's two fantastic Chinese poets that I really love, ancient Chinese poets from the Tang Dynasty, which is mentioned in the poem. And their names are Tu Fu and uh, Li Bo. And they were friends and they you know, wandered around the mountains writing poetry and uh, looking at the stars and so forth and drinking wine because Li Bo died uh, trying to, he drowned in a river the legend says, uh, trying to hug the reflection of the moon, you know, in the water. Uh, and so this is uh, about some of my favorite things, which include Chinese poetry and Szechuan tofu, which is a spicy Chinese dish, very delicious. Sing Tao is a Chinese beer. Uh, and plate spinner, you know, is the stick with the plate on top, which actually originated in ancient China. These poems are combining high and low, you know, high culture and low culture. They're supposed to be funny. They are funny, according to me. Uh, <laughs> but so, yes, there we are. Uh, here we are. Bagatelle for Tufu, Szechuan Tofu, Sing Tao, Li Bo, and Plate Spinner. April shows a nipple, but only one. For five days, I have sold my waking hours. A fool like the cook who walks ranting from the closet kitchen with plates shaped like frisbees, long, slow prayer of spring, park, Afternoon, perfect toss, unlabored, hovering, may not deign to sink unlike my plate of tofu, rehydrated mushrooms, yellow peppers, ginger slop, and rice, half-drunken lunch. 
Never was I so alone. Such lunch. Tu Fu's buddy Li Bo died trying to hug the moon with sodden arms reflected in a river. In my mind sometimes I am in China, falling through the Chinese air, pockets filled with teriyaki chicken wings. I live a six-month journey from my parents, where their ages, a grandfather clock earring, pain, what the Tang poets took for granted, language outlives us. The waitress asks, do you want chopsticks? Of course, but rice is difficultly singular, so I lick surreptitiously the plate when she goes, spicy moon. Um, and I think I'll just read two more, very short. Uh, this is uh, Bagatelle for Philip Glass, pipe organ and pipe organ in lieu of prayer. Philip Glass uh, played in Prague the day after the election, the night after the election. It's a six hour time difference, but uh, yes. And uh, I went to see him with my wife and we sat in the front row and we wept uh, for hours uh, as soon as he touched a, <laughs> a key. I'm a great fan of Philip Glass, you know, and there's something very spiritual about his work and so forth. Uh, and this is about being an altar boy. Bagatelle for Philip Glass and pipe organ in lieu of prayer. Thoughtless on a sunny day, empowered by the radiance, let us pray. Forgive the merciless indifference we pay, tabernacle and tackle box. How easy tiny joys elude us. Joy eludes us, yet we, preening pride in the annihilated need to kneel before anything, unless observing ceremonies necessary to get ahead to heaven or the boardroom. As an altar boy, I loved velvet silences of sacristies, brass taper holders, bell-shaped snuff that flamed a hand to reach me as I, mischievous, melted old wax with a wooden match, hollered in my head the devil I felt had found me a moment before returning to the grim serenity of God. A while ago, when we first met, I mentioned that uh, a poet that I really love, Rilke, you know, elegy, begin in elegy, end in prayer, end in uh, praise, although that was kind of a prayer that I just read. And here comes the praise, and, and I'd like to end on this poem, and thank you for your attention, and uh, just so happy to be here. Uh, Bagatelle for Prague, Plymouth, and Memory Stick. The early poems I read are really based in the landscape and, you know, the beach and everything. And these are kind of moving more kind of into an awareness of language and, you know, thinking about the way that uh, memory is tied to language and words and the way that certain words like sunburn, you know, the first time you get a sunburn and you're like, what the heck is going on with my body and the world? And someone tells you it's a sunburn and then it's, uh, you know, signified and signifier. Um, yeah, Bagatelle for Prague, Plymouth, and Memory Stick, which is also known as USB. I think they changed the name or something at some time. But uh, so, uh, in Prague, I stop, ears cocked to a window where air rushes at me, puckered with sound. A garage bands not altogether terrible anarchy in the UK song. There are many ways to get what you want quote from the song, so I ramble around the ruined stadium, down by my old dormitory, dreaming of a letter that's waited the quarter score years I've lived elsewhere. It lies in the back of a pigeonhole no longer named for me, lobby where I do not exist. Something is written there, one word that will change my life. The story of this journey starts here. Sunburn, mom said ruthless signifier, skin sloughed in childhood sand dunes, long howl down corridors of air to this threshold city where ocean is literary creation and I carry music like Samson in my beard and later on my Samson. Listen, listen, something wonderful has happened to all of us. Here we are. Thank you. Thank you.
Good evening, and I'd like to thank John and Stephen for including me, and uh, Gabby and uh, Wilfried Library for supporting this. Um, one of the things that strikes me listening to the other two poets here tonight is um, the wide range of poetry that's um, available to us. I mean, every poet is going to have a, a kind of a different style and a different voice, um, and I suppose a different subject. And uh, so this is going to be sort of a third way to tell a story. <laughs> um, my poems are um, kind of experimental, or um, they're prose poems. Um, and I've written free verse, but over the last few years I've been working in this format, which is kind of marginalized by the, um, I guess, the literary establishment. Uh, and that includes uh, some poetry journals. Um, and I've been fortunate enough to be able to publish despite that. And what you're likely to find in these, uh, the thing I like about prose poetry is, as the name suggests, there's this incredible tension between um, the prose format and then the poetry that occurs within it. And that's kind of what I try to exploit. Um, as was mentioned, uh, Gabby mentioned in my introduction, I am a professor, and I'm a professor of journalism. And um, I think some of my, uh, and my experience it was in daily newspapers before I made the, uh, uh, fell back on academe, which is, um, quote James Thurber, is a little bit like falling back on a, uh, uh, a box of carpenter tools. <laughs> um, uh, uh, but one of the things you'll probably pick up on is that, you know, my language is pretty simple, um, I'm kind of journalistic in that regard. But I think that's part of the challenge, is being able to make sort of everyday language do uh, sort of un-everyday things. So this is a poem called uh, Twilight Lasts a Long Time. It becomes like a ghost, like a wolf on the island with us. Like a zen reluctantly rented tuxedo. Like frequent, inexplicable echoes of protesters chanting, hell no, we won't go, hell no, we won't go. It becomes like this absolutely black blackbird against the green field. Like a once barren landscape being repopulated by women with the heads of deer, like sixth graders going on a field trip to see a man hanged. It becomes like the lost hiker who is just a mile or less away when the county sheriff decides to abandon the search. Uh, this is uh, called The Titanic Sales at Dawn, which is a title poem of a collection that I published earlier this year. And um, I'm sure there's some Dylan fans among you. And we'll recognize that this is a, li uh, a line from uh, Desolation Row, sort of where I live. Um, so uh, The Titanic Sails at Dawn. A girl was stuck in the rubble, only her head visible. She was staring straight at us, and I think that's why every month is a kind of choking, a confused wind of travels. I have taken part for a while now in cultural appropriation, unconscious plagiarism, maybe even a bit of banditry, walking around on my hands and knees and finding rocks and sticks. Stay far away from the area. The area is not safe. Stay away. People are crying, shoving, tripping, trying to leave, scrambling everywhere. It's like they all know those diary locks don't actually work. Uh, this is a poem called Reality Show. Uh, I looked out your window and saw the same things you had been seeing for half a year. Cadaverous men in stovepipes, hats, and tarnished frock coats coming out of fog into sunlight. I can't share with anyone that memory of the acid green and the gray that I now have. They would say, it's all a bunch of shit. 
I don't sleep well because I'm so nervous about it. At some point, we're going to have to decide what's real and what isn't. Let's talk to each other the way the words in a poem talk to each other. Uh, so uh, I have three grandsons, no granddaughters. My, drives my wife slowly insane. Um, uh, so we have three grandsons, and the oldest just had a birthday. So I don't usually write occasional poems. You know, there's occasions you write a poem to celebrate it. But uh, something about this uh, touched me. Now, I didn't give it to him because um, it would depress the hell out of him. And he uh, probably has to wait till he's about 18 to get this. He just turned eight. OK, so, um, so grandson, now that you're eight, you have to know how to travel on foot. You have to know how to make fire without matches. You have to know how to catch a trout with your bare hands. It's fairly easy. You just have to understand how the trout thinks. You have to know how to forge a document, let's say a gun permit, in a country under military rule. You have to know how to open a safety lock, surreptitiously, of course, with burglar tools. Most important, you have to know how to tell at a glance night from other darkness. And now for something a little different. Um, I read a lot of uh, biographies of artists and writers, you know, and um, uh, I came across this story. Uh, I don't know, I, I, I was reading this art book and uh, I came uh, across a characterization of uh, the French sculptor uh, Rodin. And I kind of used that as a basis for this poem, which I call Golden Years. Given the choice, I want to be the sort of shrewd, goatish old man it said Rodin was, strolling the broad boulevards and ornate arcades of Paris after a productive morning in the studio, a young Russian-born French lady leaning lightly on, my arm, on his arm. And if her eyes were too wide apart for her to be considered a classic beauty, or if she hadn't actually read any of the books he recommended, he didn't care, because it had just turned fall, and the air was like a crisp white wine, and they always felt at least a little drunk. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, this poem's called A New Kind of Heaven, and uh, Again, it's, it's based on an actual, I read something, and uh, it became the, the opening is, is a historically accurate, and the ending is something I saw out the window <laughs> or placing in Hyannis, so, and I kind of you know, synthesized it. So it's called The New Kind of Heaven. The hangman was drunk on the job. A sheriff's deputy had to climb up to press the button that triggered the trap door. It was 1936 and the last public execution in the United States. A medical student conducted the autopsy. He took out the intestines, said, yup, it's all there, and then shoved them back in. The body was buried in a secret location. Uh, uh, body was buried in a secret location for reasons that have never been satisfactorily explained. Today, we go about these things entirely differently. An osprey passes overhead with steady, languid, wing beats, while clutching in its claws a fish astonished to be flying. Uh, this is, uh, a, uh, again, a, uh, something called cosmic blues. I'm not really into cosmic things, but I don't have a choice. Salvador Dali is forever. I used to see sugos everywhere. Then a mirror unrolled from the sky, and the seagulls were just skeletons. None of it made a lot of sense. Someone said to me, it's simple. A black hole is where time and space disappear. Simple? Solid objects are melting into air at an alarming pace. It's not an unknown future. It's almost here. I think it must be like a wasp nest in a barrack in a German concentration camp or 634 minutes inside a volcano. 
How about one or two more? And, uh, because I, I appreciate your forbearance. This is a lot of poetry for me. Um, uh, There's a poem called Ant Dreams. Freud caught sight of a nasty old man on the train, only to realize it was his own reflection. His carry-all bag on the overhead rack contained an entire set of ant dreams preserved in amber. Enemies lurked everywhere, but after the train pulled in, he eluded them by frequently changing facial expressions. Later, he forgot the word cremated and had to shout to his wife through the, his study door, what's it called, incinerating the body. From the window, he had a view of the public park including a tree whose firm, round fruit the children like to pretend were bombs. Okay. Uh, oh, this is the last one. Uh, why try? To see the fire coming at you from five miles away, like a funeral cortege covered in red bite marks, was proof if any of us needed it, that it's not pleasant out there, that in fact, it's close to fucking awful. One moment after another, teetering on the edge of calamity. And yet, the story goes that when Matisse was old and incapacitated, too feeble to get out of bed without help, or even comfortably hold a paintbrush, he rubbed charcoal on the end of a stick and made drawings on the ceiling. It had just seemed so empty. But thank you. Thank you so much to our poets tonight. And if you enjoyed what you heard, uh, John Bonani will be reading in two weeks at Sturgis Library in Barnstable. He'll be reading with the poet Chen Chen. And, 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 and you can go over Howie's house. Um, so that'll be great. And then, of course, we also have some poetry coming up here at Wellfleet Library. Um, next, let's see, next Monday, um, that's the 15th, we'll be having um, Neil Silverblatt will be reading with Ed Meek. And on Thursday of the same week, that's July 18th, we have a, another wonderful um, group of folks reading. So that will be um, Martin Edmonds. Mitch Manning, and James Stotts. So um, once again, thank you all so much for coming, for being here, and I hope you have a lovely night. Yeah.